All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening. For those that don't know me, I'm Angie Jones, Director of the Family Business Center. It's Kirsten Luffler, Assistant Director. Um, and we are going to start by thanking a few people. Um, I need to acknowledge all the people who helped us help get us here. First, we're able to host events like these because of our supportive and committed sponsors. So I want to start by recognizing and thanking our sponsors, uh, many of whom are represented tonight. We got Eastman and Smith, Fifth Third Bank, Huntington National Bank, Highland, Raymond, Shoemaker Loop and Kendrick, Skylight Financial Group, and the William Vaughn Company. And then a special thanks to Toledo Spirits for opening the bellwether for us this evening. This is, might be one of the coolest places we've held this event. Oh, thanks. And I need to recognize the late Jim and Celia Finley, who established a fund with the center to support this specific event. Jim was one of the founders of the center, and anyone who knew him knew he cherished family and how much he loved the center. He established this fund to ensure that we got together once a year to celebrate each other and to celebrate family business. And that we will do. So thank you, Jim and Celia. Um, okay. And extremely instrumental in making tonight happen is the amazing team that we have at the center. So I'm going to take a few minutes to identify everyone. Um, Kirsten and Sally in the back that was checking everyone in. So, yeah. I don't even know how to express how important they are. So we take the team approach in a lot of the things that we do, and they are so integral to the team. We work so well together, and I would truly be lost without, with both of them, without both of them. And then speaking of being lost without people, many of you know we lost Emily Waggy this summer to NAI Harmon, um, which we were really bummed about, still a little raw, but she got, and I believe she's online, she was going to be online, so hopefully she's there, um, but we got, she got Harmon to join the center, and now she's a member, so we just Toby her. And then for those that don't know what that means, we use to Toby as a verb, and it's, it means we'll just add her to a bunch of committees and we'll still get to work with her, which is what we do to Toby Caulfield, hence we'll Toby her, so. Um, and while we miss Emily, she's doing a fabulous job. I see Harmon all over my social media, so they are very lucky to have her. So. But on a positive note with that, I'd like to introduce our new marketing events coordinator, Megan O'Brien. Where are you at, Megan? So, yeah. And I promise I'm going to stop calling you new Emily. Kirsten pointed that out the other day. She's like, you've got to stop calling her new Emily. Um, today is Megan's first day. So she started with a four-hour HR training, and then she gets to spend the rest of her evening in a bar. So that's not, not a bad day work, right? Um, so yeah, welcome, Megan. We're excited to have you. Um, we also have a new intern, um, student intern, Warren Galloway. Where are you at, Warren? Back there? Yep. Warren has a long list of stuff that we've been collecting for the last year. Oh, we'll give this to the student intern when we get one. We'll give this to the student. And he's doing a fabulous job. So he's been around a two, few weeks now, so we're glad to have Warren. Um, I'd also like to thank Katie Christ. Many of you know her, our Family Business Student Association president. She helps at all of our events. Um, Katie's great. And then Dean Ann Ballas, who could not be here tonight, but she's been a tremendous supporter and advocate of our center in the local business community, and Maria Schmelzeride with our University of Toledo Foundation, who you will hear from a little bit later. So, and of course, special thanks to Matt and Eric, and non-brother Matt, who is Eric's assistant, so that confused us for a little while in the beginning, because his email is Kripke assistant, but it's Matt, but it's not Matt Kripke, but thank you to non-brother Matt, who helped um, quite a bit with the logistics. So, and we are happy to have Center OGs Pam and Debbie here. So they're right, right there. So we're happy to have you guys here today too. So thank you. And of course, oh, I'm sorry. I've been told I have to eat, eat the, the mic, mic. So I'm sorry about that. Um, and of course we want to thank Angie Jones, right? She's up here thanking all of us. And we certainly want to thank her for everything she does on behalf of the center staff. So thank you to Angie for all you do for us. Thank you. I did not put that in the script though. No, she didn't, but she deserves that. Um, and as Angie mentioned, Debbie Scutch is here. Um, and in her legacy as director, we will be awarding the exclusive Scutchy Awards tonight. So, <laughs> now these are of course the talk of the town. Um, but in case there's someone out there who happens to not know what these are, maybe Hollywood hasn't heard 
about them yet. I don't know. We'll find out later. Um, but they are the most coveted, the highest honor to be bestowed upon the U Toledo Family Business Center and quite possibly the University of Toledo. So if you are getting a scutchy tonight, you're lucky. Let's just put it that way. You're a big deal. Yes. So if you're a fan of The Office, they are pretty much on par with the Dundies. I mean, I don't think that we're Michael Scott, but I guess I could be wrong. Um, and so we're going to be sprinkling a few of those uh, throughout the evening tonight. So pay attention. Okay, so I'm going to start. We had a great year, and I'm going to take a minute to brag about the center, which is something I don't do as much as I should because we have a lot to brag about. And I'm going to try to stick to script because at this point I could go off and talk for 30 minutes. So... Um, we have a record 242 member companies. That was a 12% net growth over the last year. Our member retention held strong at 96%. I always talk about member retention, but I should take a minute and talk about our sponsor retention. Uh, two of our sponsors have been with us since day one. One other sponsor has been with us since 96. Another two have been with us as long as they possibly could since 2009. I think the other three maybe turned over in the last like five to six years. Um, so we have a great sponsor retention and we really appreciate all of their support. We added two new affinity groups, so we're total at 27. We doubled our programming from a few years ago and we're pushing a lot of content out um, through all kinds of media channels. Um, our advisory board chair, Todd Hendricks, who is in the back, is always telling us, content, content, content. You have so much of it. So we've been, over the last year, really trying to do a lot with that and put that out. Um, you see, I went off script there. Now i got to think back where I was. Okay. And my favorite stat of all time, our participation rate, or our engagement rate is 94%. Um, over the past four, or the last year, we've had four very successful certificate programs with three more planned for the first half of 20. 2022. And then Kirsten and I both published articles, her with Dr. Janelle Whitmer and me with uh, Janelle and Dr. Clint Longenecker. And we have Andrew Kite, who's a big name in the family business world, working with us in his, as an executive in residence this year. So we absolutely, again, would not be able to do all of this without you and our sponsors, our members. So there have been a few members that have really stepped up this past year, enough to earn them a scutchie. We have one scutchie we like to give out every year that we call the All In, and it's awarded to someone who's been very supportive of the center in a variety of ways. This year's recipient has been involved with the center really from day one, but particularly helpful to us the past few years. Um, providing insights, advice, support, participating on committees, attending our events, and she has led many of our affinity group onboardings, our tune-ups, and our trainings. This year's All In Scutchy goes to Lori Gross. <laughs> You'll want to find a special spot for this. Oh, thank you guys. Here you go. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you for thank all you, you do for us. Okay. And because we love this one so much, we decided to award an all in student edition to our wonderful Family Business Student Association president, Katie Christ. Katie's been with the. Oh, yes. She, so better than any scholarship you'll get. So Katie has been with the organization for three years. She comes to all our events. She's always happy to uh, lend a hand, and sometimes we give her the really crappy jobs, but she always does it. Um, she's there regardless. So Katie graduates in a year, and I'm pretty sure she has a, not a year, this year, and I'm pretty sure she might have a job lined up, but if she doesn't, you all might want to try to scoop her up. So all in student edition, Katie Christ. Thank you. Hello, get your... Okay, so then continuing along the lines of we wouldn't be able to do what we do without you, next up is the Sounds Great Scutchy. So this goes to a person that we have leaned on a lot this past year and a half. Um, someone who, anytime we ask for something, whether it be to present at a webinar, to talk to a group, to dumb down all of the tax changes for us, he's always there. Actually, we had a lot of different names that we wanted to call this one. 
uh, Angie and I went back and forth on what the Scutchy should be named. We could have called it the Sure Scutchy or the Hey, I Know That Guy or the Fan Favorite or He Makes Sense Out of Nonsense Scutchy, whatever it may be. But we were thinking about it and we realized anytime we ask him something, he responds with, sounds great. And we thought that that sounds great. So the Sounds Great Scutchy goes to Mike Camp. Yeah. And we had a meeting with Mike, and I was trying to uh, get Sounds Great into the conversation over and over. I don't know if you caught on to that or not, but here is your Sounds Great Scutchy. Thank so you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, and so one stat that I didn't mention earlier is that our endowment this year hit $3 million. So, yes. So that's huge for us uh, as the money... The money we get from the endowment represents more than a quarter of our entire budget. And as many of you may know, that our budget solely comes from our endowment member dues and sponsors. So we hit that in the summer, and we had about a minute to celebrate before getting back to our goal, which is raising more money to close out our campaign. And with the help of Maria Schmelzeride with the University of Toledo Foundation, I'm confident we'll get there. So I asked, we're kicking that off into full gear this year in our uh, 30th year. So I asked Maria if she wouldn't mind saying a few words about that. Thank you, Angie. Um, I am so excited to be here in person this year. Um, last year I watched, a uh, little bit jealous that everyone was having a great time while I was watching in my Zoom sweater and comfy pants. Um, but sincerely grateful to be a part of the Family Business Center, um, play a small role and get to know Kirsten and Angie and the rest of the team. Um, and really just getting to know some of you, many of you, and hearing your personal stories and your business journey. And um, just, it's remarkable for the city of Toledo. And as a Toledo native, I am so proud of um, calling Toledo my home and the Family Business Center being a part of it. So we have raised almost $650,000 towards our $1 million goal. Thanks to so many of you. So I think give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> and as Angie mentioned, we are looking to close out this campaign and celebrate reaching or going beyond our $1 million goal next year during our 30th anniversary. So um, I am so grateful to those of you that have supported um, and for those of you that are interested and um, haven't been able to connect with yet, I'd love to connect with you or you can reach out to Angie or Kirsten. Um, and again, thank you for what you're doing for the future of the Family Business Center. It's incredibly special. Thank you. So we are beyond grateful to be working with Maria. Um, one, we have just a ton of fun working with her. And then she's fabulous at what she does. And I've learned so much from her already and really looking forward to this next year. So, and then you know we have a scutchy for this, right? This year we have the Giving Back Is Not Whack scutchy. And it is awarded to Mike and Karen Langendurfer. So, yes. So this year alone, they've generously given to our campaign, sponsored part of the golf outing, sponsored the bar at one of the events, and everyone loves the bar sponsor, right? Um, their gift is the reason we were able to have the, um, the executive in residence this year. And just the other evening, they were awarded uh, the EBE award too, the Entrepreneur um, in Excellence Hall of Fame. So the giving back is not whack, scutchy goes to Mike and Karen Langendurfer. Okay, two more scutchies, um, two more scutchies to get through, and then we'll get on with the program. So, um, okay, so next up is our lifetime achievement scutchie. So past recipients include Toby Caulfield, Sharon Skilleter, Fred Truehaft, and this year's award goes to someone who both Kirsten and I have really enjoyed getting to know, someone who shows up for everything, provides invaluable advice, actually reads the stuff in the emails that I send out. And I know this because sometimes he replies back with grammar corrections for me, which I really do appreciate. 
Um, and he's just all around a really good person who is passionate about the family part of family business. And we are grateful he chooses to share his time and talent with us. He also just finished his term on our advisory board. He is a past advisory board chair. Um, but don't worry because he will be getting tobied. So we, as a token of our appreciation for his service, we have a UT blanket, which is nice, but not as nice as the uh, Lifetime Achievement Scutchie, and that goes to Joel Gorski. Thank you, Joel. We appreciate everything. Do you want to say a few words? You don't have to. You could just say thank you and be done. Well, so it's been a few years that the center's been in existence here. Uh, and, and our family. Your wife has spoken. She said, hold your mic to your mouth. You, you come here and do it. You do a better and then he job. said, you come up here and do it, Claire. No, it's been a pleasure to be a part of the center over the years. Um, family started it years ago, uh, leading by example. Others have been a part of this. And so um, it was my turn to step up and, and do it for a while as well. But uh, uh, thank you very much for the recognition. It's been a blast. It's been a pleasure working with Angie and Kirsten and uh, with Maria as well. So. Uh, uh, Thank you for the recognition and long live the center. Thank you, Joel. Okay. So we lost Joel on our board, but again, we're tobying him. So Joel will be around for quite a while. And we do have two new board members joining us this January. Uh, Jennifer Hildebrand um, from the Trust Company Family Offices, who is unable to be here, and Mike Langendurfer. And they bring a ton. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Rick. Let's do it. Good. Um, they bring a ton of experience and expertise to the board. We're excited they both agreed to join us. So, and you know what? If you are a current or past board member, why don't you stand up so we can give you all some recognition? Because again, you're the ones that really help us do what we do here, so. And now I'm going to pass it off to Kirsten to give out the last scutchie, then introduce our speakers. And I got my margarita sitting right there for me. That's the joy of being the director. She gets to go do that. Okay, so now I have one more scutchie to give out before we get on with the program. Um, in a few minutes, Eric Kripke and Matt Kripke, they're going to talk about their experiences and Eric about his experiences working with Emmy nominated The Boys, which if you aren't familiar with, is about superheroes in today's world. So we saw it fitting to give out a superhero-ish scutchy this evening. So the Man of Steel and Wonder Woman moderator duo scutchy goes to Bill Steele and Katrina Ayat. They've been moderators for Affinity Group 3 for a while. Um, it's been a bunch of, it's recently been a bunch of leading gens and retirees who seem to be busier than anybody else. Um, and it's an interesting group to manage, but they do it with a smile on their face. So Bill is here. The other half is at the Rolling Stones concert in Detroit. <laughs> but I'm sure the Man of Steel will accept on her behalf. So Bill? OK. So now we get to get on with the show, with the part that you guys are all here for, to hear Matt and Eric. Um, we're excited and grateful to have brothers Matt and Eric Kripke here with us this evening to talk about their experiences growing up in a family business, their career trajectories, and what life is like in the movie business, and how it relates back to family business. Um, okay, so Matt, if you want to come on up, we're going to go ahead and get this all set up.
Okay. So I'm going to start with a few questions for Matt, and then I'm going to turn the tables and let Matt interview Eric, which should be fun. They're very fun to watch together. Okay. So if you guys wouldn't mind, if you could please start by giving us an overview of Kripke Enterprises. So Kripke Enterprises is based here in Toledo. We have offices in Tennessee and Florida. We are in the aluminum recycling business throughout North America. We also do some export outside of North America. And here we just open retail scrap recycling in Toledo. We also have an aluminum coil division. I know that you're very excited to hear about this. No one really wants to hear about the TV business. So you, I'll keep going. Okay. Actually, that's enough. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay. So now tell us about growing up in the family business. What was your relationship like? Um, how and if were you all engaged in the family business when you were younger? So my dad, Larry, worked with his brothers, um, Harley and Bobby, and they work with their father, Sherwin, in a family business. And in 1983, my dad came in my bedroom, I was 15 years old, and he said, uh, I need to talk to you about something. Your uncles and I, we have an offer to sell the company. And I said, wow, that's great. Why are you talking to me? And he said, because I thought one day we would work together. Yeah. And I said, well, you should definitely sell the company because I am never going to work <laughs> in the scrap business. Never. And um, fast forward uh, a number of years later, and it didn't hold a lot of appeal. So for those of you who have family businesses and are disappointed that your kids are, how come they're not interested? How come they don't see the benefit in this? Uh, maybe they'll come around. And uh, as it turns out for my parents, they got one out of three, the best one. Eric, what about your perspective in growing up in the family business? I just, can, can everyone hear me, by the way? Um, uh, yeah, I, I just want to be clear that my dad never came into my room and said, uh, I'm, you know, I thought we would work together one day. That, that, I, I hadn't, that, that's never happened in, to, to me. Um, you know, I have great love for that business, um, you know, like even though I'm not, actually specifically in it like i've always felt it was in our blood i mean it was it was our grandfather and it was our uncles um and and it was conversations at dinners and family gatherings and uh on weekends some of my happiest memories are i would dad would take me to his office and i would get to like play around and you know, back in that day, they had a, a, a car bailer, like one of those great car crushers and got to watch the cars getting crushed. And like, it was just, it was always um, a part of who we were. So, you know, though I'm not in that business, I, I you know, I do consider Kripke Enterprises in that business a big part of my identity. Great. Well, thank you both for sharing that. Um, okay, so from there, you went off in different directions for college. Matt, you went to U of M. We'll accept that. <laughs> Eric, you went to USC. I guess we'll accept that too. You um, notice there's no applause for that <laughs> at all. <laughs> not, a lot of, not a lot of USC fans there. Uh, so what led you in those different directions? Um, well, I followed in, uh, I have two uncles who went to the University of Michigan and my parents met there at the University of Michigan. I was going uh, dragged up to football games just like Steve Scutch from the time I was probably four years old and I was basically brainwashed and um, as it turns out I loved it but uh, you know my parents have paid for a lot of therapy for the brainwashing. Fair, fair. Eric what about you? Um, you know, I, I think what made it probably slightly easier for my parents and family is I was like, a, I was a very one, I was just a weird kid in general. And two, I was weird in that from really from like age nine, 
uh, I wanted to make movies and TV shows. It was sort of the only thing I ever said I wanted to do. Um, I think, so I, I was always so driven on it and so driven to come to Los Angeles. And, and, and so when I got into the USC film school, uh, I mean, that was really scary to move from 18 years old and move from Toledo to uh, where USC is, which is, you know, downtown Los Angeles. Um, and I was really terrified, but uh, uh, they were really great about uh, uh, supporting me and they've been nothing but supportive the whole time. Um, they did make me apply to Michigan, uh, because, but, but outside of that, um, but outside of that, they've been amazing. So tell the truth, when you applied to Michigan, how disappointed are you that they didn't let you in? <laughs> I'll have you know, I was accepted to Michigan and uh, on the uh, on the special better than your brother's scholarship. Uh, so. So I'm going to take over some of the questions. Um, so Eric, for those of you who are not aware, um, if you didn't do a like a Wikipedia or Google search before this event, um, I'm very proud of my younger brother. He is um, a Eric, are you a four or five times showrunner? Uh, uh, five. Five. Five, five times showrunner. Can just so that people here understand what that is, because the first time I heard the expression showrunner, I thought it was someone who got coffee for everyone on a show. <laughs> so what exactly is a showrunner? Um, it's the the simplest way to put it is it's it's Tina Fey's job in 30 Rock. The slightly more complicated way to put it is your job is literally to run the show. You're sort of the person in charge of every big decision um, from figuring out the budgets to running the writer's room to casting and handling the actors to giving the directors and editors notes, deciding how it looks, deciding how ev everything feels. Behind every show you watch, there's a showrunner who is the person who, who sets the tone. In movies, you guys are probably maybe more familiar with the idea that in movies, there's the director. You know, there's a Steven Spielberg movie and he made that movie. Um, in television, that job is the showrunner. So, let me do the math. So in um, 2005, um, you got Supernatural on the air. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So Supernatural good. was, was kind of your first big one. There was one small uh, one before that. And yes. that was your, that was mom's favorite, by the way. <laughs> I um, know. Joni is the only one who loved Tarzan. Yeah, um, that was, and it, for the record, it sucked out loud. Yes. Agreed. So um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about, you know, you, you have an idea for a show, you go in and you do a pitch. We've all seen it played out like in a movie or TV. Um, walk us through what that process looks like. You go and you do this, this pitch for this show that ends up being on the air for 15 years. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I think, you know, I think one of the big takeaways of this evening is is you know our business my particular business gets a lot of mythologizing but it's really like any other business it's it's really any presentation um and to, just to tell a short story about it is you know i had this opportunity to pitch this show supernatural uh that matt's talking to and i put together a really elaborate pitch i was really excited um, I came in, you know, I, I pitched my little heart out. I had a whole presentation to Warner Brothers. To, so there's about five or six executives in a room listening. Um, and when it was over, they said, yeah, no, thanks. You know, pass. We're not that interested. And, and I could have said, oh, well, well, thanks anyway. But I didn't. I said, well, what part are, you know, is there what part are you interested in? What part aren't you? And they said, well, we like the idea that it's scary and there's ghost stories, but this whole, you know, I had a story about a reporter. This whole story about a reporter is boring and played out. Do you have anything else? 
and I, I wrote in my notebook the day before, like you could tell this story with you know two guys in a car, which ended up becoming the show. So just right there in the moment, I said, well, I had this whole other pitch about it and it's amazing. And it's about these two brothers, which I made up on the spot because I was thinking of Matt actually. And, uh, and I was like, there's these two brothers and they travel around and, and they, they fight ghosts. And then the Warner Brothers people lean forward and they say, oh my God, that's amazing. You know, tell us more, pitch that. I said, oh, I'd love to, but I, my pitch is home. I need to go home and get it. Can we set a new meeting? And then I went home and then wrote that pitch. Um, so like anything, it's like you have to be able to think on your feet and, and absorb the curveballs that are thrown your way. Uh, so yeah, and then after that, you write a script and, you know, hopefully get a director and so on and so on. It's a great business lesson on pivoting, which we all had to do uh, over the last 18 months or 20 months, however, it feels like it's been seven years, but over the last like 20 months or so of COVID, a lot of us have had to pivot and, and uh, change the way that we did things. Um, you just shot season three for the boys up in Toronto and t tell us a little bit about what that's like to shoot during COVID. What are some of the extra protocols and, and what's the extra cost involved in doing that? Yeah, it, it was definitely the hardest for all of us. I mean, everyone who's here tonight, I mean, what a difficult year, especially, you know, trying to run, you know, all of our businesses. Um, and yeah, no, it was a lot more challenging um, because when, when you think about it, um, the, the, the people who are the most vulnerable on, in our entire production um, are the ones who are the most important and you can't do it without, which are the actors. Like they can't wear a mask. They can't have any facial, you know, shield while they're on camera. Sometimes they're kissing. Sometimes they're really face to face. Sometimes there's love scenes or they're fighting, but they're always in really close contact with no protective gear whatsoever. Um, and then they have makeup artists who are touching their face all day and hair people and costume people. So that was really hard. So the, the only way to deal with that is everyone around them has to be so stringently protected and masked up and daily tested. Um, because an actor getting sick is, a, is millions and millions of dollars loss if you can't shoot for however long they're sick. I mean, that's a disaster. Um, so, you know, every single person had to have masks, you know, again, like a lot of our businesses, but it really slows things down because every two hours you have to have a water break. And so your entire crew has to just step outside just so they can drink a, a bottle of water uh, and then come back because they just, they're not allowed to be anywhere near the actor without wearing complete with a mask and a face shield. Um, so it was really intense and that's, it's hard, uh, you know, when you're trying to do fight scenes and explosions and love scenes, you know, with all of that, but Matt, I would ask you, I would ask you the same question. Like, how did you guys manage, uh, when you were dealing with COVID this well, year? I'll answer that in a second, but I don't want to let you off the hook on something. Oh. What is, give us a rough number. You don't have to give us the exact number, but the rough number of the budget per episode for a show like The Boys and how much extra did it cost you to film during COVID? Uh, it's a, uh, without getting too, too specific, um, you know, it would be a high seven figure show uh, per episode. Um, so, and then COVID, uh, slap on top of that for per episode, easily another 20%. So it's a huge expense. Um, and, you know, and, and the, the studio, the studios whose job it is, is to not bleed money, um, are, we're bleeding money. So, you know, on top of everything else, the, the battles, you know, to, to just try to, because they're spending a lot of money keeping people safe and you can't argue with that. But then they say to you, well, then don't do the car chase. And, and it's my job as a producer to protect the quality of it. And I would always say, you know, people aren't grading, people won't grade this season on a curve. 
people aren't going to say, oh, well, it was really hard to do it during COVID, so we'll, we'll accept a subpar show. It's like the audience can never know the difference. So we have to do all of the same crazy stuff we would do, even though it's harder and more expensive. Um, and then crazy small things like um, uh, in Toronto, like there's price gouging, right? Because the supply chain, like which we really suffered from, uh, uh, the cost of lumber went up 170%. And, and all we do is build sets. Sets are not really metal or brick or anything that you think they are. They're just giant wood structures. Um, and so we lost like a couple million dollars just from the, the cost of lumber. So just raw materials. So again, it's a, it's a lot of the same problems everyone else has. So yes, now I wanna, I wanna hear like how, what, how you guys pivoted with COVID. All right, but now you just open us up to another question. I, I will answer it. We're trying to hide. Why are you trying to hide so much? What are you, what are you trying to hide? We, the, contrary to what you heard, we are not responsible for COVID. We didn't do it. Um, <laughs> so like a lot of companies, we all struggled the same way that you guys did back in uh, March of, of last year. We made the same decision that many of you did, and we, we just shut down for a while. We told our employees to go home. We worked. We, didn't, we weren't sure. Think about all the uncertainty that we all faced, and we... Um, uh, we did what we could remotely. Our volume went down by 70% um, for a couple months. And then we um, had a meeting and we decided to pivot. And, and that's when we decided we're going to go into retail, which is buying scrap from the public because of our location at the corner of Central and Centennial. You have an old lawnmower, please bring it in. You have an old bike, please bring it in. This isn't supposed to be an ad, but... Um, we're paying, I think, 50 cents for aluminum cans right now. Um, but yeah, no, not each. That would, well, it depends what's in them. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, and then we, uh, we started slowly bringing people back in the office. And, and um, we, we currently still wear masks when we get up from our desk because we do not want to take a chance that we're shutting our business down again. That was a really painful time. A lot of our employees were very scared and we were very clear with them on Zoom calls that we had uh, daily. We said, we're gonna continue paying you, your job is safe, your job is safe, your job is safe. And even though they hear that, they don't believe you. And even though you've given them 25 years of building credibility, they still don't believe it because they see what's going on in the world. And, um, you know, and, and uh, slowly but surely, we, with a lot of help from a lot of people, we made it back. Um, but it was tough to keep people safe. And it was, um, you know, our, our HR person, Emily Fisher, is here tonight. And she just did an incredible job. Uh, Emily's been very active in the UT Center for Family Business for years, by the way. And um, she did an incredible job keeping our employees uh, safe so we was that enough of an answer for you eric yeah yeah it was good all right enough boring stuff about us let's hear about the movie business <laughs> all right so eric in the tv business a show like the boys with a multi-million dollar budget per episode how many people work on that show uh so many that I couldn't give you an exact number because it's it's all like moving and building. But um, uh, when you're in production, it's it's easily it's pretty significantly north of 300. Um, but people come and go based on your needs, right? Carpenters show up to build, teamsters, uh, uh, and then never mind like all the special effects, visual effects, lighting. So it's just different crews. That's part of what I love about that job is. It's, it's take one business and then take 20 businesses and all of them experts in a particular field. And then they all kind of come together to make this one, this one thing. That's really exciting to, to see. Um, you mentioned yeah, unions, you mentioned actors. Um, which ones are more difficult to work with? 
<laughs> actors, actors are more difficult than the unions. I have to say, you know, there. Uh, I don't. I'm not in the group that negotiates contracts with the unions, but I'm definitely in the group that negotiates with the actors. All right, without mentioning any names. <laughs> There's no. Who is the most difficult actor on your show? You don't um, have to answer that. Don't answer yeah, that. Yeah, no, don't. there's no way I'm going to answer that. Um, of, how about this one? Of the people who, who you have worked with, whether as a director or some of the producers you've worked with, um, who is your... Who do you think you've taken some things from as mentors and, and what are some of the things you've taken from them? Um, uh, you know, I've been fortunate. I've, got to, I've gotten to work with um, a lot of, you know, really smart and interesting people. Um, uh, one of the producers on The Boys with me is Seth Rogen. And he's, the, the thing I'll say about Seth is, is you know, it's not gossip, but is, um, uh, the character you see on screen is not Seth. Seth is remarkably driven and ambitious and focused and smart um, because when you think about it, you just don't reach that height of, of a really difficult business without being completely on point all the time. Um, so that kind of stoner sloppy thing is not at all who he is. Uh, he's, he's, really focused and sharp um wait are you saying that he doesn't like weed he does like weed yes but he's by the way able to smoke an incredible amount of it and remain completely on point um which is not a skill that i possess um the uh honestly the best advice i ever got um and i think you know a lot of it goes towards people in management positions um is uh, that one, when I started Supernatural, I was quite young and they paired me up with an older showrunner um, named uh, Bob Singer. Um, you know, he had, he had made some shows that, you know, were big in the early nineties, you know, things like Midnight Caller and, 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 and stuff like that. Uh, and so he sort of trained me. Um, and on the very first day, the very first thing he said to me is still the best advice I ever got um, in that particular job, which is, um, he said, you're in the business of making decisions. Uh, and the corollary to that rule is it doesn't actually have to be the right decision. Um, and I found that to be the most valuable advice for my, at least my particular job, um, because people want to know what direction they're rowing in. Um, and when you, and they can just smell blood in the water. And, and when you're like, well, I don't know, I gotta think about it, let me sleep on it. They're just sitting and waiting for you now. So pro productivity goes off a cliff. Um, but if you give them a decision and there's something they can work on, even if you drive home that night and you say, ah, that was, you know what, that was the wrong decision. You can still come in the next morning and say, that was the wrong decision. And now we're rowing in that direction. And, and they're still active and engaged and maybe finding things, even if you'd gone the wrong way for a minute, even finding things that you wouldn't have found otherwise. Um, so I, I found that just in terms of human management, um, you, uh, 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 if you just stop and the wind just drops out of your sails and you're just there drifting, waiting for a moment, you're, you're dead, you're dead. Um, and I see people do it all the time. Shows fail. And I think the number one reason shows fail is um, the, the showrunners aren't decisive. Uh, so I don't know. That would be, what's the best advice you ever got, Matt? And it's probably from dad or papa. Um, sure. There's there's a lot of um, a lot of things that uh, I've heard from Dad over the years. When he started our business, his main focus and my mom was our accountant when he started out. His main focus, he just said, "I have three rules, Joni. When we start this business, pay people on time, pay people on time, pay people on time," and that was it. 
That's that. It's simple as it sounds. That's how we grew the business, and that is something uh, Scott Chafee, our CFO, is here tonight, and uh, that's something that we still do and we take very seriously. And um, people re rely on us as um, to make sure that we keep them in business, and we we have a responsibility to do that. Um, the other thing is, it's a Zig Ziglar quote, and that is. Uh, People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I've been on sets watching you in action, it's evident to me that uh, I feel like I took that from dad, and that's the way that he ran his business. He, he went out of his way to care for his employees, and they knew it, and they felt it. And when I watch you on set um, interacting with people, that's what I gather, and I, you know, if you were to ask me why you're successful, yeah, you're you're smart, you're talented, you're somewhat good looking, according to mom, but um, it's really that you you help people uh, feel valued, and um, watching that is is really cool to see in person. Yeah, I would say. Um, uh, a huge reason I'm, I, I feel I was able to get to where I got um, was because of how we were raised and, and watching dad, you know, do his thing. I mean, you know, dad was, of course, you know, our, our in terms of running a business and managing personalities was, was both of our, you know, first and, and, and most influential teacher. And, um, you know, the thing that's weird about my job is uh, at one moment, you have to be the most intensely creative, artsy, you know, what's that character's emotion? And then, and then a call will come and you need to put out a fire or someone wants to yell at you about a budget or, and it's just, you're shifting from right to left brain so quickly, like whiplash quick. Um, and a lot of people who come out to be writers are, are, are very, very artistic and can't handle that. And, but because we grew up of, you treat people with respect and here's how you manage business and here's how you keep people motivated. Um, all of which I learned from dad, here's Midwestern common sense, which is in very short supply out here. And, and all of those things gave me a managerial skill that lets me do my job that I in no way would have been able to do had I not grown up in the family business. All right, so three quick things, very, very quick, and then we want to open up to some questions. So uh, number one, yes, we both agree that dad was a great role model. Um, Eric, I'll give you a chance to shoot first. Um, Mom is going to be really pissed if you don't say anything nice about her. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, I, mom was the best possible mother. Uh, she gave, she was always my first and best audience. I would say, uh, the reason I'm so confident is because mom was, uh, always like laughing so hard at whatever dumb thing I had to say as a 10 year old and, uh, the amount of love and support she gave, uh, all of her children and the amount of dedication and devotion. Um, we were raised with so much love. It was, it was hard not to turn out, you know, at least pretty functional. What about you? Ditto. <laughs> and her baking. Let's not forget her baking. Um, mom, seriously, I know you're watching. I do love you. Um, have you, the, the show is on Amazon Prime. Um, Amazon is famously owned by a guy who is, has a few dollars. Have you ever met Jeff B? Is it Bezos? Bezos? How do you pronounce his name? Uh, Bezos. Have you ever met Jeff Bezos? What's he like? I have actually, I'll tell a super quick story. Um, I went to an Amazon Christmas party, you know, like we all have Christmas parties and, and, uh, and my wife, Deanna came with me and, um, it was, a, it was pretty awesome. Like, you know, there was like Al Pacino in the corner and, and, you know, like these celebrities everywhere. And uh, uh, I'm just standing with Deanna having a drink. And, and she says, um, uh, Hey, I'm going to do a lap and, you know, and see what celebrities I can see. I'm like, okay, do that. So I'm standing by myself for a moment. 
this this like young you know twenties assistant comes out of nowhere and who and I've never seen her before in my life and she's like uh, Eric uh, Jeff wants to meet you um, stay where you are are you going to stay here just stay here and I go okay uh, and she vanishes and I stand there just kind of chilling for like 45 seconds and then this like army of security guards like emerges out of the crowd and like encircles me and they're all completely encircled into this party and then from the from between two of them jeff comes in you know shakes my hand says you know big fan of the show and love what you've done and thank you and and it was great um, and I said, thank you very much. And wow. And it's an honor to meet you and, and all that. And he's like, well, great. And thank you. And, and then he like turns and vanishes into this, you know, past these security and then the security file away and they file after him and they vanish into the crowd. And I never saw him again that night. And then my wife comes up and she's like, I didn't see anyone. Did you? <laughs> So that was my Jeff Bezos story. All right. And then the, the only other thing that I, I do want to touch on is um, famously in the show Supernatural, at least locally here, and then a little bit in The Boys, um, you have referenced Toledo area um, yeah. landmarks. Um, you've also not as famously cast a number of Toledoans um, in in your shows. So talk about that for one second, and then we'll open it up to questions. Yeah, no, I mean, look, I've, people ask me uh, where I'm from, and, you know, and I've, or, and um, though I've lived in Los Angeles since I was 18, I still say I'm an Ohioan. And, you know, it's such a big part of my identity and, and who I am and how I was raised um, that, you know, I like to try to bring as much of the Midwest into my work as possible. Um, so for instance, in Supernatural, um, every road uh, in the first episode is a road in Toledo or Sylvania. Um, you know, I like to throw references in all over the place. In that first episode, Adrian Palicki, who is from Toledo, was in that episode of Supernatural. Um, we just have a spinoff of the boys that we start shooting, um, and an, an actress from Toledo named Lizzie Broadway um, is going to be one of the leads. Uh, so I like to keep you know Toledo with me whenever I can, and I think maybe the best final thing to say before questions is um, if you ever make it to the end of the boys or Supernatural. You know, I have a production company logo that comes up and my production company is called Kripke Enterprises, Scrap Metal and Entertainment. And um, it's Matt and Dad's logo. Um, and I like, to, you know, it, it makes me feel closer to them to feel like uh, I'm just doing, I'm just running the West Coast branch of the family business. Um, and, and that's why I named my production company that, because I felt so close to the family business that I, uh, I wanted to nudge my way in and be a part of it, even though they gave me no permission to do so. Right. And, you know, dad never approached you. <laughs> yeah, I know. No, I'm trying. Um, the, we're going to go to we're going to go to questions. But uh, the funny thing is, because he named his company Kripke Enterprises and that comes up at the end we get headshots, we get scripts, um, you know, it's very weird being in the recycling business and the aluminum business and having people send us like these, uh, glossies and, you know, fortunately we haven't got any nudes. That would be weird. <laughs> okay. Well, now that we know how cool the Kripke brothers are, <laughs> Um, we're going to pass it off to questions. So Katie's going to take it around. So if anybody has any questions, please raise your hand and she will come around and make sure that your questions are answered. Is there a way? Uh, um, the question was to me, Eric, um, this is probably the one and only question to me. There, um, it was, 
when did I decide to be in the family business? And the, the interesting uh, road to get there is um, my dad almost died, and so I came in to keep the business going. Um, he had started the business a year and a half earlier. At the time, I was working in a different family business with uh, my Uncle Harley. And um, my dad had a perforated ulcer in his, on his uh, jejunum and had bile spilling out into his stomach and had to go to the emergency room. And they op thought he was having appendicitis. They open him up and have to seal him up. And he was basically in the hospital for about 30 days. And so I went to my uncles and said, uh, I know I don't work there, but can I go try to help him out and keep him going? Because his business was a year and a half old and it was him and my mom and, and one administrative assistant at the time. And uh, so I started answering the phones. I didn't know what these people were talking about. I didn't understand what a load of painted siding meant. I didn't understand what a load of, of, you guys all know what UBCs are, right? Yeah, used beverage cans, obviously, <laughs> duh. And um, I didn't know what it was when people were offering that, and I, I would go up to the hospital at lunch and after work every day, and, and my dad would tell me who to call and where to go and how to get a price. And I didn't know what I was doing. I started putting deals together. And he came out of the hospital after a while. And I said, I kind of like what you do. Um, you know, never thought that I would, but I like it. And he uh, fortunately was willing to let me come in. So that's the, that's the long version. If you want, I'll tell you the shorter version later. <laughs> I don't know if there's a way to bring up the chat. And is there a way to do the chat? Yeah, okay. you can write in the chat or you can repeat it, Matt, whatever you think is best. I can't see it. Oh, got it. Eric, can you hear me? You yeah. Recognize my voice. <laughs> hey, Uncle Harley, how are you? <laughs> in, in, in the first year series of Supernatural, uh, you were very nice in putting Aunt Stacy and Uncle Harley in it, but we got killed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I always wondered why we got killed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I genuinely, truly, this sounds like a joke, but it's not. Like, I only kill the people I love. <laughs> um, I've, I've killed uh, I think I've killed Matt I've killed all of my friends uh, uh, it's just I like coming up when I name people I like naming them the people I love and unfortunately in my shows those people usually end up dying but it's with great love is there a way to enable chat that these or some people can because there's some people who are trying to raise their hand and ask a question It looks like Cole Reiser is raising his hand to ask a question. We'll go with that. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, Eric, uh, do you and the boys, do you have a favorite character create, creatively? Someone that you're... Uh... Um, do you, uh, uh, they're all, like, I, you know, I love them all for different reasons. In so many ways, they're all kind of your kids. Um, uh, the character who's the most fun to write for, I don't know if you watch the show, but there's like, <clears throat> the show is about what happens if superheroes were real and um, in our exact world. And the favorite, my favorite character to write for is this Aquaman character called the Deep um, because it's the dumbest power. Like talking to fish is the stupidest power in the world. And um, so he's a blast to write for because he's always like talking to dolphins and lobsters and, and uh, and he's for some reason he, he, the writers just love writing that particular character. 
He meets uh, a Toledo girl, doesn't he? Isn't that one of the... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so he... Uh, 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 right, in season one, and he has gills. He's a terrible person, by the way. He's not a likable... The superheroes aren't good guys in this show. They're all horrible, horrible people. They're basically celebrities. Um, and uh, he he gets into a Me Too situation and he gets banished to Sandusky. Um, and... And and he was working and 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 you know and the the guy his representative there is like there's Cedar Point and it's going to be great and then uh, he has a, a a date with a girl uh, who's wearing a, a mud hen's shirt um, and she like assaults him <laughs> and and I remember Matt I think you talked to the the man who owns the mud hens and he's like hey terrific the mud hens were in the boys. And it's like from a woman who was sexually assaulting a man is not the advertising I think that you want. But hey, no yes. such thing as bad press. So, so Joe Napoli is a fan of the boys, and he he loved that uh, the mud hen shirt was in there. Um, he was just over at our office, and uh, he was telling the rest of his. Uh, his people are over visiting that they need to watch it and and they loved that you put the mud hen stuff in there yeah. all right i'm going to read this one from uh cole oh. greiser okay and this is for you eric it says eric it's evident that your visual style started with your shorts whoa like battle of the sexes deep cut deep cut that was a uh short film that eric won uh, an I, award for was that it at uh, Sundance Film Festival? It was. It was just the, the award was just being accepted at Sundance Film Festival. So, all right. Yeah. As a filmmaker myself, I'm finding my style through current projects. Prior to Supernatural, how did you advance your craft as a fellow kid from Toledo and navigate the uncertain times with confidence that you will make this dream a reality? The short version of that is: How did you get confidence to do what you're doing? <laughs> right. Uh, you never really have uh, uh, total confidence. Um, uh, I always say, uh, show me a writer who thinks his stuff is amazing and I'll show you a bad writer. Um, the, uh, the truth is, um, you know, you need to be, I mean, I think what you're asking is like, how do you break in? And, um, you know, first, eventually you need to be where they're making the stuff um, or at least making the decisions of where they're making the stuff. And that's New York or Los Angeles, um, which is scary. I was really scared uh, to, to go. Um, and then, because that's just where, you know, you, you're a production assistant on a movie and you get coffee and then you're able to, it's just, you have to, it's a hard business to get in and you have to try to break open every door. And then the thing I would say most of all, um, is uh, uh, filmmaking is way more a craft than it is in art. It, you know, I liken it to carpentry. It doesn't require some genius strike from lightning. It requires practice. Um, so if you want to write, write all the time. If you want to make films, you have an advantage that I don't have that you could make a really professional looking movie for a thousand dollars or less with, you know, online uh, uh, visual effects and material you know, what would have cost me fifteen, twenty thousand $20,000 to make the movie you can do for a thousand. Um, so shoot all the time, write all the time. Um, you know, you don't need someone in Hollywood to say you're a filmmaker, just start making films. I, I don't could you hear that Eric or no no right. not. What, the question is what was your favorite show or sh I guess show idea that you tried to get out and it wasn't successful you mean a show that was made yeah, I feel like a a sh revolution, maybe. okay <laughs> what, what? he said what was your favorite show that wasn't successful and then he said revolution maybe <laughs> um uh, I would say, uh, I'd say I had a, there was a time travel show on NBC that I ran, um, and created with, um, 
this really awesome writer named Sean Ryan who made The Shield uh, called Timeless. And it was like a time travel show. Um, I liked that show. I thought that show had like a good spirit and it was a really positive, fun show that you could show your family. Um, and uh, the uh, Re revolution almost killed me. I mean, yes, it was a good show, but it, it was, I was making that show for JJ Abrams as a producer and, um, and I was working, I was easily working 17 hour days, seven days a week. And um, I was, I was going to die if I kept making that show. I actually have to admit, I was relieved when it was canceled um, because I just, I needed the, I was just, I was exhausted. So the takeaway is J.J. Abrams is a terrible person. Is that no, that's not face. That's not at all. All right. All right. So there's a question on here from Chad Kripke, and it says, ah! so far you've gotten like four questions, one's from your uncle and one's from your cousin. So <laughs> you guys seems like it's going great. Thanksgiving, you couldn't yeah. have waited. Yeah. yeah, seems like it's going great. Seems great. Yeah, it says, Eric, aside from ratings and awards, how do you personally gauge your success as a showrunner or filmmaker? Uh, that's a good question, Chad. Um, and that should be, you know, again, that applies to everybody's business, um, which is uh, you have to uh, um, satisfy yourself. Um, you cannot get into the game of trying to make other people happy with what you're making. Um, I could tell you that the stuff that became a hit and the stuff that crashed and burned, I could not tell you the difference between them. Um, I, in my mind, I was, as you're making all of them, you're like, these are gonna be awesome. And then one explodes and everyone hates it. And then one is a hit. And I, I couldn't tell you what I did different. Um, so you can't predict it. You can't predict how the outside world is gonna react to anything you do. Um, so all you can do is make sure that you're proud of it and you're happy about it. And it's something that for my particular business entertains me or everyone else's business, just something that they can feel proud about. Um, and that's the only way everything else makes things. It's just too, too, too impossible. Um, what about you, Matt? How do you, how do you gain, what do you consider? Is it just, is it about the amount of, is it, is it income? Is it about the amount of trades? Like how do you, how do you gauge it? Um, by, uh, the lives that you've impacted, that's how I gauge yeah. it is, uh, you know, I, I have a personal goal, um, to create 10 millionaires out of my company of people who were not a millionaires when they came to work there. Yeah. Um, we just embarked on a new homeowners program. Um, where we, Emily, put together a uh, financial literacy course for our hourly employees mainly, but the salaried employees who don't own a home or have never owned a home can take part in it. And um, after they go through the course and the last day is actually Wednesday, um, they are eligible for a deposit on a, a new home and then we're gonna pay $100 a month towards their mortgage for three years. and. Um, what I'm excited about is a lot of people want to own a home, but they don't know how to do it. And um, we're trying to help them get there. So I, I define, um, we, we define success by how many, really in general, how many people's lives can you impact in this world? Mm -hmm. um, and you have a, a platform to do it on a, on a big way in this last year has um, has been so tough for so many people. And, and uh, during COVID last year, you made so many people laugh during that time. Uh, the Boys is, uh, for those of you unaware who have never seen it, it is the most streamed show uh, in the history of Amazon. So um, I believe, is that still true? Yeah, 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 no, it's pretty close. It's pretty close, yeah, yeah. All right, well, when he says pretty close, that means that I just was, uh, as David Letterman used to say, that was a little bit of writer's embellishment on my part. <laughs> so we have time for like one more question. Oh, Joe Schrader. Well, first off, uh, Matt and Eric, 
Thank you so much for sharing your family story. This is the right forum to share it in. You guys have got a great story. It's the second time that I've been uh, fortunate enough to hear the story. Um, and so, uh, Eric, great job out there in, in, in Hollywood. Thank you. Thank you. So, and, 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 and Matt, you, you do pretty well here, too. Um, <laughs> so my question, my question is, and, and by the way, that, that whole millionaires and homeowners, I mean, great stuff. Uh, we, need, we need to probably share best practices because that's good stuff that maybe others will, would implement. But um, my, my question is to, to Eric. So um, you talked about the Midwest culture, and, and of course, we're, we're all very proud of the Midwest here, being Midwesterns, and, and I agree. I've, I've got two sisters on the West Coast, um, and brother or son on the East Coast, and, and, and you know, we, we really feel comfortable that you know, we, are, we are like the salt of the earth here in the, in the Midwest. So tell me about, um, you, your comment was that there's not enough Midwest culture uh, in going around on the West Coast, and it's an advantage for you Eric, in your position. So could you kind of like get a little in detail about that a little more? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I would say that what comes like with the Midwest, you know, I look, I think the, I think common sense is famous and, and but um, uh, for me, really, the, the, the biggest one is, is humility. Uh, and, you know, egos are not in short supply out here. And, and people really, I think, get full of themselves. Um, and it makes them unpleasant <laughs> to be around. And it leads to toxic work environments. Um, but to have the humility, it, it, you know, Again, you can see, like I take my lead from uh, my brother, and I take, you know, the lead. I take my lead, and where I go from, um, or I take where I go from Matt's lead and from my dad's lead, is is you treat people with respect, and and you are not some amazing thing. You're just another person just trying to do a job and trying to manage people. And so you, you treat everyone with kindness. You, I, I open every you know, production with a big meeting and, and everyone, and I say, every single request is going to be please and thank you, or I'm going to talk to you. Um, you're going to lead with kindness. We're not going to have any drama here. Um, if you have a problem with someone, you're going to direct, face them directly and talk it out calmly and respectfully. Um, because we're all just, and we're all going to make sure that we can go home safely and be with our families because that's infinitely more important than anything we're doing on the job. And, and so it's just those types of things are things that I learned from the, from the Midwest. You, you, you put family first and you put, you know, your fellow human first and, and, and only then do you worry about the work. Um, and I, and I think that attitude, I think, you know, you just, Matt just said it, it's clear, uh, uh, you know, I learned that from, from Matt and I learned that from my dad and my mom. Excellent. Keep, keep, uh, spreading the Midwest, uh, culture out there. We, we <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you both so much for uh, being here. So Eric, thank you for giving us a glimpse of what it's like in Hollywood, and thank you for being open and candid with your stories. I'm a huge fan of the boys. And when did we say season three is dropping? Uh, <laughs> the way they're, they haven't announced it yet, but it'll be like middle of next year. OK, all right. Um, so thank you for everything. Matt, thank you for your time as well, um, your support and involvement with the center and over the years and um, the good work you do in the community and your company, and we very much appreciate that. Eric, your work is amazing. We know someday you'll get that Emmy, and I will be here for it. I'm uh, on. Thanks. But tonight, we're going to give the award to Matt. He gets our very last scutchy for the evening. <laughs> oh, here it. This is the, and this, this might be, his mom's online right now. This might be her proudest moment right now. You get the 
it's better than an Emmy scutchie. So, so you're welcome. Right, right. So when you do win that Emmy, Eric, hopefully we'll have you guys, we can get a picture of those side by side, or if, when you're doing your Emmy speech, if you want to give a nod to the scutchie, that's fine. If you need a scutchie for your prop room, that's fine too. Let us know. We can get you one of those. We'd love to see that on an episode of The Boys. Um, so finally, a big thank you to Jim Kenzie back there. Um, I'm fairly confident that this would be a hot mess if this were left up to Kirsten and I to figure this out with the TVs and the videos and the Zoom. So thank you, Jim, for being here. We always appreciate your support. And he's been here all day. I mean, it's not bad being in a bar all day long, but Jim has been here all day working on this for us. So we very much appreciate that. Um, Thank you to Kripke for the fun drinks, the recyclable drinks that you can use over and over, or the drink cups. If you don't have one, we have some up here. I think they were using them for the beer. There's some at the bar. There's some up here. If you didn't get one, make sure that you get one. Um, thank you to Noah with Green Eye Photography. He's around here um, capturing the evening for us. We appreciate that. Watch for LinkedIn, Facebook. We'll get all those pictures out there. Please like and share. We recorded a session. We will get this online on our YouTube site. We'll send that link out. You'll want to share that with everyone because I thought this was absolutely fabulous. Um, and I think that's it. I think I covered everyone. Thank you all for attending. Uh, that's a wrap. And now the countdown ends, or the countdown starts for our 30th anniversary celebration, which will be next year around this time. And I feel like we'll probably start planning that next week. So welcome, Megan. You know, it's something we can start working on. Um, thank you. Thanks. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye.